right, can everyone hear me? Perfect. Welcome to United Astronomy Clubs of New Jersey. Once again, we're back on our uh, Jenny Jump uh, State Park location in Hope, New Jersey. I want to thank everyone who is in our online audience and both there and here in person. So a couple things. Uh, well, I see a couple people are probably making their way down. I see a couple people just getting parked right now. Uh, you can check us out on our website. That's uacnj.org. That's where you'll find information on all our member clubs, as well as a list of all our upcoming and past talks and any special events that we may be doing. If You, you can also check uh, find us on our social media sites, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and we also have a Discord channel. I want to thank everyone who has uh, donated to keep us afloat. We are a nonprofit organization, and as such, you can also find donation links on our website, including Patreon. Uh, now, for uh, those people who are here, if you need to use the bathroom, we have the porta potty with the red light on it to my right, your left. Uh, through the door outlined in r the red rope light to my left, your right, that is our gift shop in the museum area. I'm sorry I wasn't behind the desk right before the talk, but I will be there after the presentation. Um, all the proceeds do keep us, uh, help us pay our bills and keep the lights on and keep offering these free public programs. Uh, quick safety note, when we do go to leave, please use your headlights. As much as we don't necessarily like getting blinded, we do like seeing where people are and not getting run over. However, if we do have flashlights, please keep them pointed towards the ground because as much as we need the headlights, we do not need additional uh, lights flashing in anyone's eyes. With that, we're gonna get started in tonight's presentation with Walt Windisch. He has been interested in astronomy since he saw the Pleiades as a Boy Scout. He bought his first telescope in 1985, just in time to see Halley's Comet. Walt's a member of the North Jersey Astronomical Group and Rockland Astronomy Club. He's been coming up to Jenny Jump for over 20 years, and he's going to tell us about the beauty and power of the universe. I think that, yeah, you I got, got the right one. Yeah, you got it. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. Thanks a lot for coming out tonight. How many are campers? Just for my info. All right. I'll be thinking of you tonight as I crank up my AC one more notch. <laughs> now, this is, a, this, this is a great spot for camping. Beautiful trails and uh, hopefully you'll have a great weekend as well. Well, my talk, I've entitled The Beauty and Power of the Universe. And uh, just for this presentation, I wore my favorite nerd shirt. It has the latest discovery from uh, the James Webb Telescope that science discovers that the rings of Saturn are really lost airline luggage. And that's making more sense every day, believe me. But what, I, what I'd like to do in, in this is I'm going to talk about some of my favorite objects in the universe and, uh, and ones that are beautiful and, and that have a lot of hidden power behind them that we just can't realize without thinking about them or without science telling us about them because they just look pretty from out there. And I'm also going to take you time traveling. Does anybody have any idea how I can take you time traveling? Okay, I'll give you a, I'll give you a hint. So this is one of the farthest known galaxies in the universe that we have discovered with a real scientific uh, sounding name. But it's about 13.3 billion light years from Earth. So what does that mean? It means that the light from this galaxy took 13.3 billion years to reach us. So we're gonna, we do time traveling just by looking in a telescope because we're looking back almost to the beginning, the universe as, as scientists reckon, uh, you know, within 420 million years after the Big Bang. So we're looking way back just by a telescope, a Hubble telescope, but a telescope nonetheless. So when we look at, at this picture, we are really traveling back in time. So the telescope is going to be our time machine. It's going to give us uh, glimpses of how certain objects appeared at different times in history. 
And of course, history itself is relative unless you peg it to something. So I'm talking about the history of the Earth. So we're going to look back. When I say we look back 13.3 billion years, we're reckoning from today on this planet. So the light from the sun is eight minutes old by the time it gets here. So when we look at the sun, we're seeing light that's actually eight minutes old already. The moon's 239,000 miles from us. So it only takes light, which travels at 186,000 miles per second and change. It only takes the light about one second to get here. So when we look at the moon, we're seeing light that's one second old. Unless we realize, of course, that that light's coming from the sun. And then we've got to add on the other eight minutes. And by the way, light and sound travel at different speeds. So even though light travels at 186,000 miles per second, sound only travels at 1,100 feet per second. So if the moon ever exploded, we would see the explosion in one second. But it would take us 14 days to hear the explosion because the sound travels so much slower. And there's actually a practical application for this. When, when we hear the thunderstorm, when you see the lightning, if you count the seconds be before between lightning and the thunder, you can figure out how far away the storm is by just multiplying by 1,100 feet. So if, if you hear, see lightning and it's five seconds before you hear thunder, then you know that the storm is 5,500 feet away or about a mile away. If the next time you hear it and you only get four seconds, then you know that the storm's moving towards you. But in space, of course, there is no sound. So as I said, the galaxy we just saw galaxy, GNZ11, was thought to be the farthest and oldest galaxy known at 13.4 billion light years, or 134, I got to read this, 134 nonillion kilometers, which is 134 followed by 30 zeros. So th that's pretty far away. You know, measuring and verifying such a, a distance is, is not easy, but scientists use something called the redshift to, to figure out how far away something is. The universe is expanding, and as, as things move away from us, their signatures are shifted to the red. So we know what certain elements, what light, signa what light signatures certain elements give us. And those signatures stay the same, but as something moves away from us, they get shifted to the red, to, to the red side of the spectrum. And the farther to the red they go, the farther away th they are, the faster they're moving away from us. It's kind of like when a train comes to you. As it approaches you, it's blue shifted. You hear the pitch gets higher. But then as it goes away from you, it goes, right, like a race car. It gets lower in pitch. That's because the sound waves are being stretched out. That's the red shift. Light does the same thing. So when we look up in the sky and we see objects that are, that light signatures are shifted to the red, we can figure out how far away they are from us. Here's yet another blob. The pictures get prettier from here. <laughs> but uh, so far this year, Galaxy HD1 has been crowned the farthest object in the cosmos, according to an article that was released in the Astrophysics Journal uh, in April. So this is very bright in the ultraviolet end, which, which is very interesting to, to scientists. They're figuring it's 13.5 billion light years away, or only 330 million years after the Big Bang. And, and scientists expect there might be more surprises here. They think they might see some population uh, three stars or maybe even the earliest supermassive black hole ever detected. A population three star is very interesting because those are stars. Those were the first stars that, that came into uh, existence, that formed. And, and modern stars, ones that are formed today, recycle uh, star stuff. They recycle elements that have been spewed out by supernovas and other stars that have died before them. But the first stars uh, did not have that. And so, according to Astronomy Magazine, they consist entirely of hydrogen, helium, and a sampling of uh, lithium and beryllium. So, they're, they're much purer. They're also uh, more massive, more luminous, and they're hotter than today's stars.
you could kind of think of them as the, the young and restless stars, right? They lived fast and they died young. Uh, they burn out within uh, only a few million years, which is, which is pretty quick. Our sun, by comparison, is about 4.5 billion years old, and it's got another 5 billion of years on, on, its, on its tread still. But the only problem here is because of these stars' lifestyle, they're still hypothetical. Scientists believe they, they know that they, they exist, but they have yet to actually prove their existence. So this galaxy was discovered using the Hawaii-based uh, Subaru telescope. And there's plans to revisit it with the James Webb Space Telescope in the future. Um, and by the way, on September 17th, I'll be talking about the James Webb Telescope and giving you an update on it and, and some of the latest pictures from it. Uh, so if you're interested, stop by. This diagram I put just kind of puts the time travel stuff in, in perspective. Here we've got the Big Bang, and here's us. We've got a redshift of zero, and it's the present day. And as we look further and further into the universe, we see further into time. We can't see back here. That first, that last galaxy I mentioned is the newly identified farthest galaxy candidate. Again, it hasn't been confirmed yet. And then here's the furthest galaxy confirmed to date. Here we have the reionization error when newly formed stars and galaxies start to reionize the universe. And then here's the, uh, the age of the modern galaxies that, that we, uh, we see now. They're within a, a couple of billion years. So from here to here, by current reckoning, is about 13.8 billion years, which is the age of the universe. Before I go on, I just want to cover one last piece of uh, science basics, the electromagnetic spectrum. And the point to remember here is that the electromagnetic spectrum covers everything from radio waves all the way down to PET scan and, and gamma ray flashes. The shorter the wavelength, the more energy is in that part of the spectrum. This is the visible light spectrum. So as you can see, our eyes only see a little tiny bit of the spectrum. But scientists have instruments that they can hook up to a telescope that allow them to see into the infrared and the ultraviolet and get a lot more information about it, our objects than our, our eyes could possibly see. Um, and even in the visible light spectrum, our eyes act, act like a, a camera that has like a 1 30th second shutter speed. So we can look at some objects up in the sky and they'll look like cloudy or foggy objects. We won't see much color. When we're looking at faint objects, our eyes just can't gather enough light whereas the Hubble telescope can open up its shutter and take a couple days worth of an exposure. And then we see some, some color come, come through there. So we're going to take a look at some photos that were taken in all parts of the, the uh, electromagnetic spectrum. Here's one example of, of uh, using infrared light outside of the visible range to detect what's obscured from visible light spectrum. Uh, this is a, a herbig harrow object, and uh, these objects are bright nebulous regions of, of gas and dust and are usually buried within dark clouds. And by going into the infrared side, we can see through those clouds. But here's a much more dramatic example of the difference uh, in wavelengths. This is the Eagle Nebula, and this particular picture was taken in the visible light area with the Hel Hubble telescope. This is also nicknamed the, oh, the Pillars of Creation because these large columns of gas give birth to stars. The way stars start out is a gas cloud collapse and the, uh, the gravity starts to pick up. There's enough pressure under the gravity for fusion, nuclear fusion to start, and that ignites the star and you get a protostar. This Eagle Nebula is about 6,500 light years away in the constellation Serpens. Um, the tallest column is about four light years from top to bottom. So it takes light four years to travel down here. 
it's 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 a huge scale that's that's hard to even Im imagine this is the exact same field but it's taken in the infrared by the hubble uh, telescope here you can see a very different picture we cut through a lot of the dust uh, because we're looking at the heat behind it in, in infrared and uh, we can see a lot more of, of the uh, the stars that are being born and also the background stars but we can't see through the the thickest parts of the of the dust and then here's just a side by side to give, give you a, an idea um, the, the dense clouds are molecular hydrogen gas, which are uh, two atoms of hydrogen in every molecule. Now here's a wide angle view of the Eagle Nebula. It's much wider. If you look, you can see the, the columns right there that we were looking at in the other views. But you can see it's a much larger view. Matter of fact, right here is a very hot, intense uh, cluster of, of stars. Um, uh, Ber uh, an astronomer named Burnham nicknamed this the queen of the stars and it, it's a very hot young star cluster uh, it's visible in, in modest backyard telescopes so you could see this yourself is there a question I can't, okay yeah, yeah we will have a, a Q&A session uh, at the end it's really hard to see back there uh, so th this star cluster above is sculpting and illuminating it. I mean, when you think that this is four light years, this is another four light years, the light from this is actually what's illuminating this. Just to give you an idea of how hot and, 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 and uh, powerful the, these, uh, these stars are. And you could think of the sculpting as erosion when you see uh, pillars of, of of uh, geologic formations on the Earth. That's kind of what's going on here, except it's with uh, very high energy ultraviolet light. It's called photoevaporation. So this star cluster is actually blowing away some of this dust, and this is this is the strongest pillars that are, are left behind. Um, so an, an interesting uh, fact here is I, I said this was 6,500 light years away from us. Now scientists have been studying earlier infrared r images as, as, as long as, along with these and they suspect that one of these massive hot stars actually went supernova. If one of these stars went supernova 6,000 years ago it blew this whole column away. This, this may not even be here anymore. But since that's estimated to happen 6,000 years ago, it's going to take us another 500 years to find out if the astronomers were right about that. And of course, much more spectacular than this being gone is a supernova here in, in an area that we can see off our telescopes in our backyards is going to be just a spectacular show. Um, I, I'm not going to make it, though. <laughs> but anyway, it, it's going to be cool for somebody if, uh, if we take care of this Earth. So, you know, I, I started off with this Eagle Nebula because it combines beauty, power, and time travel, all the elements that I want to uh, cover today. And again, you can see this formation in July and, and August in the constellation uh, The Serpents the Serpent. And uh, members of, uh, of this club, the UACNJ, have taken some pretty cool pictures of the Eagle Nebula right, right from these grounds. Let's switch gears a little. Does anybody know what type of object this is? It's a comet. Yes, sir. And comets are usually part of our so solar system, uh, gravitationally anchored to the sun. Uh, so they go in an elliptical orbit around the sun. And the time it takes for them to go around the sun is known as the comet's period. Now, I only had to add the word usually part of our solar system lately. Because in the last few years, we have found two extra, ter extra uh, uh, solar system uh, comets that actually have parabolic orbits, which means 
they came in from outside our solar system, they made a U, and then they left our solar system never to return again. And uh, that that's a that's a first, and that's only a couple of years ago that that uh, the first one was discovered about that. This one's comet Hale Bopp, and it was discovered in 1995. Its period is about 2,533 years. So in another 2,500 years, uh, you might see it return. We'll find out about the Eagle Nebula before we see this baby return. Uh, this nucleus is about 25 miles across. And there's two tails to a comet. There's an ion tail. Those are the lightest par particles, and they're affected by the solar wind. So wherever these point to, that's where the sun is because they, they are directly affected by the sun. So the sun in this picture in this on this day was somewhere down here. Now this is the dust tail. The dust tail are heavier par particles than the ion tail. And so they're not only affected by the solar wind, but they're affected by the motion of the comet. And so since this dust tail is on this side of the ion tail, you know the comet's moving this way. It's moving this way because the tail dust tail is, is being dragged that way. I need to add a little more contrast to this. This is a picture I took uh, right here at, uh, at Jenny Jump 5th, 1997. It was a four minute exposure with, uh, with a Minolta camera uh, at 50 millimeters, 1.4, nothing, nothing fancy. I'll show you the mount I used, and, and you can see it was really a low-budget deal. But I tracked, I tracked the rotation of the Earth for four minutes to get this picture. And this is actually just a scanned photograph. I'm still looking for the negative in my, my archives. I'm going to have to do uh, an archaeological dig in my basement pretty soon. Here's another picture. Uh, again, right, right from here, right from Jenny Jump. Uh, there's the comet. This was only a 45-second uh, a shot. Because if I, if I had tracked the comet for four minutes, those trees would, would have been really badly blurred because the comet moves, but the tree does not. And if I didn't track, if I did a four-minute exposure not tracking the comet, the tree would look great, but the comet and all the stars would actually be blurred because four minutes is enough uh, to, to have the rotation of the Earth uh, mess up a, 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 a photograph of the stars. So if you're shooting a wide-angle lens, you can get away with about 45 seconds. Put your tripod on, you know, under a dark sky, take a picture of the Milky Way, and uh, and uh, you will you'll get a spot, a shot. That's the mount I use to track track the rotation of the Earth. It's as I said, it was really low budget. Um, you don't have to spend a lot of money. It's fun if you have that money to spend, but uh, this is just, it just takes a, uh, a carriage bolt. And you can find this on, on the internet under uh, barn hinge or, or scotch mount. And if you turn the crank on the bottom, for some reason this pointer is gone. If you turn the crank on the bottom, one rotation per minute, it will track the earth. I actually turned it a quarter turn every 15 seconds because I wanted a little finer, uh, finer uh, tracking. And I put my camera there on the top. I pointed it at the comet, and uh, I had one of those videos that had a time station, like WWV, and I counted 15 seconds, quarter turn, 15 seconds, quarter turn. And uh, now, you you know, for a couple hundred dollars, you can buy a uh, totally automated system that'll just sit there, and you can just sit there and have a cup of coffee while you're taking your picture. This is a, a little more work. So comets are certainly beautiful when we get to see one. But this comet, a few years ago, really displayed its power. This is uh, uh, Comet Schumacher-Levy 9, was discovered a few years earlier than Hale-Bopp. It, it was discovered uh, March 24th, 1993, uh, with the telescope on, on Palomar Mountain in California. And the magnitude of the comet's brightness was reported at 14, which is uh, about a thousand times too faint for a, a unaided eye to see. By studying the comet's orbit, astronomers knew that the comet made a very close approach to Jupiter, 
on July 7th of 1992, before it was discovered. And during this close approach, the unequal gravitational attraction of Jupiter on the comet's near and five far sides broke the comet apart. That's known as, as tidal force. So it, it caused the comet to come apart. So it, it broke apart in July of 92. It broke apart into 21 fragments. And those 21 fragments slammed into Jupiter over a period of, of days centered around July 19th of that year. They hit at a speed of about 36 miles per second. And I, I remember it was a little frustrating for astronomers because it hit on the other side of Jupiter and we had to wait for Jupiter to rotate into view to see what was happening. And uh, it caused plumes thousands of kilometers high and uh, left hot bubbles of gas in the atmosphere and great dark scars like you see here. And these scars are about the size of Earth. So we're talking some, some pretty powerful stuff. The, the largest fragment was, ex, was estimated at about two kilometers. So if you had a, that, two kilometers over a mile, that's 1.2 miles. So you have something like that slam Earth, you're done. Uh, Jupiter often acts like a cosmic vacuum cleaner, perturbing orbits of, of incoming objects, asteroids and stuff, and in this case, a comet, and, and actually deflecting it from, from Earth. This was the first time that humans ever saw objects collide outside of Earth, but within the solar system. And, and of course, scientists have to you know, give it a fancy name, so they called it an extraterrestrial collision of solar system objects. This is a composite picture of those 21 f fragments uh, of the comet coming in. It, it, was, uh, it, it was quite a sight, and, and of course, uh, astronomers uh, were amused to see some of your uh, third and fourth tier newspapers were talking about aliens and you know these are the aliens coming in for a landing and all that good stuff uh, quite a lot written about that as, as well well now we're going to look at beautiful remnants that dying stars leave behind I did a talk on the life cycle of stars a few weeks ago I I'm not going to uh, cover that but I'll give you a little background so you can understand what you're looking at. Right, all stars start out as a, as a cloud of gas, as I said. And when the gas becomes dense enough, it starts to collapse under its own gravity. And as it collapses under its own gravity, it heats up. And if it's lucky, it gets hot enough to spark nuclear fusion. And then a protostar begins to shine. A hydrogen atoms fuse together to make helium in a process known as, as fusion. And it's nuclear fusion that is the energy of all stars. Our sun and all stars around one to eight times its size, up to about eight times the size of our sun, sun will take, oh, I wish I had my pointer was working. They would take the, the, the top path here. So it spends most of its time as a star once once the radiation, the force of the radiation trying to push the star out and gravity trying to suck the star in, once that becomes equal, it, it, it reaches hydrostatic equilibrium, then the star is stable and becomes a main sequence star. And 95% of the stars in the sky are main sequence stars that are in hydrostatic equilibrium. They spend most of their life there, but then they, they do move away from that. At some point, in a little less than 5 billion years, our sun's going to run out of hydrogen and start to collapse in on itself. And uh, when, it, when it does, it'll get hot enough that helium atoms will fuse into carbon and oxygen. And as helium is fused, it creates more energy, and the sun will start to expand again. This time, it's going to grow so large that it will swallow up the inner planets, including Earth, and become a red giant. So after it, it runs out of hydrogen, which is a lot shorter, the outside layers of the sun will get so far from the core that the force of gravity has less effect on them. And 
about half of this mass of the sun will will drift off into space, uh, often creating a, a beautiful remnant of, of a gas ring or some type of gas remnant, which we call a planetary nebula. It takes more massive stars than eight times our sun uh, to go supernova and have those spectacular explosions that, uh, that we see on science fiction movies. Uh, but our sun will lose half of its mass to a planetary nebula. That nebula will last about 20 to 30,000 years. And the other half will collapse into a white dwarf star. So about half the mass of the sun will collapse into a space the size of this Earth. It'll no longer be uh, burning nuclear fusion. It will, uh, it'll be hot because it's so dense. Um, it's, it's, it's so massive that a, a, a teaspoon of a white dwarf would weigh about a ton. So we're talking something a lot more massive th than the sun or, or the, the Earth. Um, so here's a few pictures of, of planetary nebula left behind by stars like our sun, ones that don't go supernova, but blow off half their mass in, a, in an envelope, in a gas envelope that looks very pretty because the white dwarf illuminates them from within. They're called planetary nebula, but they have nothing to do with planets. They just don't look like the pinpoint point stars when you see them. They look like fuzzy round circles, so they look more like a planet than a star. This is M57. This is the, one of the most well-known of the planetary nebula. It's in the constellation Lyra, right above our head. Uh, we should get someone to, uh, one of the folks on the telescope should be pointing at it tonight, so you might see it. it with your eye, it's going to look like a very tiny smoke ring just floating out there in space. Um, but it's a very ordinary glowing remains of a sun-like star. Uh, the star in the middle is the white dwarf. It's uh, 15 magnitude, 15th magnitude uh, now. And uh, the blue color represents uh, helium, uh, cyan is hydrogen, and the reddish color is nitrogen and sulfur. A lot of times when you look at, at uh, astronomical photos, uh, they've been enhanced one way or another. Sometimes they're, they're, they're pure, in just enhanced visual light. Sometimes they're color-coded for elements. Uh, the guys around here that take pictures, they put it in Photoshop to make it look as pretty as they can. So whenever you're looking at an at astronomical photo, unless you're looking in a science journal, uh, you're probably seeing something enhanced. And even in the science journals, they're usually enhanced to show different, uh, uh, different elements that are, that are in the... Uh, that are in the star or, or in the uh, nebula. This ring is about one light year wide. That means it takes light one year to go from one side uh, to the other. As I said, the, flat, the planetary nebula phase only lasts about 30,000 years or so, which is a mere uh, drop in the bucket, bucket on the astronomical scale. So look what happens when we uh, don't just look at the visible light, but we add some more information from a couple other telescopes, which uh, in include infrared. This is the same object. But what you were looking at before was just the center. Here we're seeing a lot more information because we're looking at uh, hydrogen alpha uh, wavelength and, uh, and infrared. And uh, what you're looking at, you can almost feel the movement here of, this, of the solar winds outward. You can see the lines. And this, this is the residue of the solar winds that were ejected about 10 to 100,000 years ago before the center star blew off its, its, its shell. So this was even before. This is in its red giant phase. We're seeing the remnants of the, of the solar wind here. So it combines the Hubble telescope shots uh, with the large binocular telescope and, uh, and the Subaru telescope uh, on the island of Hawaii. Here's another beautiful uh, planetary nebula. This is the Dumbbell Nebula in Volpecula, another summer object about 1,200 light years from us. It was first described by Charles Messier in 1764. Matter of fact, Messier uh, came up with a ca catalog of over 100 objects. So when you hear someone say M24 or M1, that's the Messier number. And uh, 
Charles Messier was a, a comet hunter, and he found these planetary nebula and other faint objects to be troublesome because he'd look at it and said, whoa, is that a comet? And he'd waste time uh, figuring out if it was a comet or not. So what he did was he made the Messier catalog and cataloged these objects. So when he was searching the sky for comets, he would come up on one of his known objects and know that it was not a comet and, and he would move on. He wouldn't spend time studying. He left that for other people. But uh, that's how the Messier c catalog uh, came about. And uh, in the spring, there's a couple of days a week where you could actually see all Messier objects in, in one night if you go the whole night from sundown to sunup. And they're called Messier marathons. So if you're a sick pup and you're into astronomy, that's something you can, uh, you can spend a day doing and, uh, and be looking your best on the other side of that. Here's Hubble's spirograph, a uh, very cool uh, image from uh, the year 2000. Um, its official and very boring name is IC418, but it, it glows like a multifaceted jewel, jewel, doesn't it? It looks like a jewel cut, cutter cut those patterns. It's just amazing handiwork. Uh, it lays, lies about 2,000 light years from us in the direction of the constellation uh, Lepus. And again, the picture has been enhanced to designate the different camera filters used to capture uh, different elements. So red shows ionized nitrogen, uh, green shows hydrogen, blue shows oxygen, and, and, and so on. So astronomers can study the elemental makeup of those. Now this is, this is a real wild one. This, this qualifies as a strange object in my book. Um, and I think the fact that there's not a definitive explanation for how it came about uh, pretty much substantiates my, uh, my classification there. This is called the Cat's Eye Nebula, NG6543. And it's revealed in detail from NASA's Hubble telescope once again. Um, the bullseye pattern is 11 or, or maybe even more con concentric rings or shells around the cat's eye. And really what we're looking at, each of those rings is a bubble that is encircling the entire cat's eye nebula. And so we're like, an, like you'd cut an onion in half, that's what we're looking at. We're looking at them as rings, but they're really bubbles all the way around the, the entire object. Uh, spherical bubbles projected into the sky. Um, so NASA's website tells us that observations suggest that the star ejected its mass in a series of pulses at 1500 year intervals, which is highly unusual. It's, you know, I explained the, the standard process to you already, and, and it doesn't include ejecting mass at 1500 year intervals. And the convulsions created these dust shells, each of which contains as much mass as all of our planets in the solar system for each one of those. Still not much, just 1% of the sun to put things in a bigger perspective. But these concentric shells uh, make up layered onion skin structure around the dying star. The bullseye pattern are, are open to a lot of speculation. Uh, it surprised the astronomers. Um, several explanations. It might have been cycles of magnetic activity. It might be the action of a companion star that we don't see circling around and, and help to create, helping to create those, those rings. Um, another school of thought is uh, the material was ejected smoothly from the star, and then the rings were created later on during to the formation of, uh, of waves in the outflowing of the material. I uh, haven't seen any alien theories yet on that one, uh, but it is a very interesting case, and it's, it's, a, it's an unsolved case as far as what actually uh, created it. This pretty planetary nebula is known as the Little Ghost Nebula because it's round and very faint. This was discovered in the 18th century by astronomer William Herschel as he used a as a telescope to explore the constellation of Ficus, Ophiuchus. The nebula's main ring structure is about a light year across, and the glow from ionized oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen atoms are colored blue, green, and red. It's a little over 2,000 light years away from us. 
one last planetary nebula, which I think is just an amazing example and, and very atypical, is the Butterfly Nebula. Uh, it's found in Scorpius. It's known as a bipolar nebula. Uh, it's one of the most complex stru structures observed in a planetary nebula. You know, so you got the Cat's Eye Nebula and the Butterfly Nebula, probably the, the, the two most complex uh, that I know of. And although it looks beautiful, there's amazing, tremendous power behind this beauty. The spectrum of its center star shows it to be one of the hottest stars known, with a surface temperature of about 450,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And you compare that to our sun, which is around 9,900, less than 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's, uh, it's, it's much harder th than our sun. And, and it's already lost half its shell, half, half of its mass. It's currently 64% of the mass of our sun. The central star itself can't be seen because it's hidden with this, within this donut-shaped ring. You can see right in the middle there, there's a donut-shaped ring of gas, which is it's like pinching the nebula in the, in the center. And, uh, and that's what scientists think is, is causing the, uh, the bipolar shape of span covers uh, over three light years, and these out these outflows are roiling cauldrons of gas uh, heated to more than 36,000 degrees um, Fahrenheit and racing across the sky at more than 600,000 miles an hour. So those wings are racing outward at over 600,000 miles per hour and they're 36,000 degrees hot. It looks so beautiful, but the powers is just unimaginable. It would, it, those, those wing, those, that, those hot gases are traveling so fast they could get from the Earth to the moon in 24 minutes. It's about 4,000 light years away. And again, it's a, it's a Hubble uh, telescope shot. So there's another uh, class of nebula known as reflection nebula. And those are basically dust clouds that are glowing because of the stars within them. They're not, they're not part of a, uh, of a dying star system. Uh, sometimes we see stars being formed out of them. So you already saw the little ghost nebula. This reflection nebula is, is known as the ghost nebula. And I'll be showing some of these for my uh, Halloween talk, two days before Halloween. Uh, but since there's are, the Halloween displays are already out, I figured I'd show you a few Halloween shots right now. Get in line with Kmart and all those guys. Uh, again, it's a reflection nebula in the constellation uh, Cepheus, located about 1,500 light years from us. The ghost nebula is a type of reflection nebula known as a, a globule. It's over two light years across, and there's several stars embedded in it, which is what's giving it its brown, glowing uh, color. Uh, globulars are often the birthplace of stars. Here's a wider angle view of the area around the Ghost Nebula, and people have named these the Little Goblins. Uh, it's showing just how much extended nebulosity there are, is in that, in that region. One of the most famous emission nebulas is the Pleiades. Pleiades is something we can see. It looks like, I used to, I used to call it the Little Little Dipper because it looks like a really tiny little dipper when you look, look up in the sky. In the winter time, it's usually directly overhead. It's known as M45, the Pleiades, the Seven Sisters. Uh, this is an open cluster of stars, uh, over 3,000 stars in that cluster uh, in the constellation Taurus and it's about 400 light years from us. So it's pretty close. It's one of the closest star clusters to the Earth. And uh, again, we can see it in the winter. It was originally thought that the dust around those stars uh, were, was left over from their formation. But the current thinking is that they're unrelated. It's an unrelated dust cloud. And uh, we've been able to measure the movement of that dust cloud at about 18 kilometers per second relative 
to the stars that it's in front of. So we've looked at remnants from stars around the size of our sun. We've looked at reflection nebula. Uh, so what happens to bigger stars, stars that are larger than eight times the size of our sun? Well, the common path is, is down below. You got a massive star, turns into a red supergiant, goes supernova, and after the supernova, depending on its mass, it'll either go into a neutron star or a black hole. A neutron star, if it's 8 to 60 times the size of the sun, if it's over 60 size, give or take, it's going to, uh, it's going to turn into a black hole. And we're going to see some of uh, both of those. Um, when a massive star burns, it goes past, it won't have a helium flash like the smaller stars. It'll keep on fusing elements past carbon and oxygen. So it, it'll keep on going, making more uh, heavier elements. Um, and because of the high pressure, these stars keep growing bigger and bigger, some up to a thousand times the size of the sun. Uh, they may burn hydrogen for 10 million years, helium for a million years, carbon for a thousand years. They keep burning until they get to iron, but they stop at iron. Uh, and the reason why is up to iron, the fusion reaction creates energy. When you get to iron, it starts to require energy to continue. And, and that has catastrophic consequences for a, a large star. As soon as it gets iron in its cause, core, uh, the star only has minutes to live. And, and what happens is um, it'll bounce a couple times, and then it'll just collapse in itself and explode into a, a supernova. Uh, very, very simplified explanation. Uh, it's dark. I don't want to put you to sleep. Uh, but it causes a chain, re chain reaction, and the core collapses. Um, a large number of, of neutrinos get created in the reactions in the core, and uh, the newly created neutrinos go flying outward, expelling layers of the star uh, as well, and it's called a, a supernova explosion, or a, a type 2 or core collapse supernova. There are a lot of different classifications for supernova. Matter of fact, scientists have learned there are so many types of supernova, the old classification system just isn't working well, and they're trying to, to, to come up with a new system. It, I think it's more political than anything, but uh, they need a new system to classify all these different types of supernova. The explosions are so bright that they're visible at immense dis distances. Um, if a nearby star were to undergo a supernova explosion, we'd be able to see, see it during the daytime. In modern history, no supernova has gone off that close to Earth. But uh, however, Tycho Brahe and Johann Kepler, both astronomers, observed naked eye supernova uh, during their lifetime at night. In 1987, a supernova went off about 163,000 light years from us. Uh, this is a picture of it. The supernova is down below. You can't really capture just how bright that explosion is. But supernovas explode with enough light to outshine an entire galaxy, or billions of stars. It's just an amazing e explosion. This is an artist's rendition of, of the huge shock wave that would come from uh, a type 2 or core collapse supernova. Uh, these explosions are so powerful, uh, th as I said, they can outshine an, an entire galaxy. Here's a Hubble uh, photograph of my favorite uh, neutron star. This is a supernova remnant left by a star that was larger than our sun, but less than 60 solar masses. It's called the Crab Nebula, or M1. And uh, it's a mosaic image that was created uh, through the Hubble telescope. It's six light years wide. And what I, what I love about this is when I'm looking at this, I think of uh, Japanese and Chinese astronomers in the year 1054 actually witnessed this supernova. And, and they recorded it. And it was bright enough to be seen in the daytime. They could see the supernova that formed this remnant in the day, in the year 1054. And it's just so amazing to have that connection through, a, through an object like that to other people who are on this earth in history doing astronomy 
way back in the day before they before they had anything all the expensive gadgets they didn't even have barn door hinges but this is the tattered remains of, of that supernova and there's a spinning neutron star in the middle of this uh, it's a dynamo uh, that is causing this eerie blue glow that we're seeing in, in the Crab Nebula. The blue light comes from electrons whirling at nearly the speed of light around the magnetic field lines from the neutron star. <clears throat> and the neutron star, it's actually called a pulsar because when, it was, when, it, when these pulsars were discovered, they would get pulsing signals from them, from, from the objects that they were looking at. And it turns out that the neutron star has twin beams of energy and it's spinning around like a lighthouse. And so when that beam is facing us, that's when we get the pulse. This is spinning around at 30 times a second. Uh, and and just, just an, an amazing object. Uh, the neutron star itself is about the size of Manhattan. It's about 12 miles long. And it's got about half the mass of the sun packed into that. So just amazing. It makes, it makes a, a white dwarf look like a lightweight. Here's another pulsar. This is an actual image. Uh, and, and then I got some artist renditions after this. But uh, this is called the Black Widow Pulsar. Uh, and it's a dangerous partner to have. It weighs as much as two suns, but it's only as wide as, as Washington, D.C. And it gets bigger by feeding off its mate a cool lightweight brown dwarf. The two stars orbit around each other every 94 minutes in a deadly close dance. Uh, and this, as I said, is an actual uh, photo taken in x-ray and optical and was made possible only by using the gas cloud as a magnifying glass. Uh, it's kind of like seeing a flea on the surface of Pluto. It's, it's an amazing advance in technology. G very recent photo uh, from 2018. This object's about 6,500 light years away from us. Here's an artist's rendition. You see the, the black widow pulsar in the background with its twin beams and the, uh, the brown dwarf, which is about, um, uh, about a third of the size of, of our sun, is, is in the foreground. And it's also only about 1.2 million miles from the pulsar, uh, in contrast to the Earth's distance of 93 million miles from our sun. The dwarf companion star is tidally locked to the pulsar so that one side always faces its pulsating companion, uh, much like the moon is tidally locked to the Earth and we only see one side of it. Uh, the pulsar's beams strip away layers from, uh, from the brown dwarf, and uh, sooner or later the brown dwarf will just be depleted and it will disappear and, and the black widow will be all alone. This pulsar spins at an amazing 600 times per second. Try to imagine that, the, the amount of power and mass, the mass of two suns spinning at 600 times a second. I mean, you watch science fiction movie, this stuff is stranger than the science fiction movies. This is an artist's conception of the system moving through space uh, surrounded by a cloud of gas. Uh, the companion star would be too close at this scale to even be able to detect. Um, and it's moving at 620,000 miles per hour through space uh, compared to our sun's forward velocity in the Milky Way of about 45,000 miles per hour. So uh, it, much faster. Okay, it brings us finally to the black hole. And of course, the life of a black hole starts out as a massive star, but at least 80 times the size of our sun goes through the, the same stuff as we described for the uh, neutron star. It becomes a red supergiant. It goes supernova, but because it's so massive, it ends its life as a black hole, we think. Here's an artist's rendition of a black hole. We can't really see them. What we can do is see around them. And, and black holes are so massive that they bend the very fabric of space and time itself. And so we can see images near a black hole be distorted. We can also see 
a black hole's accretion disk because anything that gets near a black hole gets eaten up. And there's a disk of, of, of super hot material that surrounds a black hole as it's, as it's devouring that object. And so although you can't see the black hole, you can see the, the accretion disk. Here's a picture of a black hole with an accretion disk, another artist rendition. But we actually did get a picture of one in April of 2017. The Event Horizon Telescope observed this supermassive black hole at the heart of a galaxy we know as M87. Uh, it's an elliptical galaxy in the Virgo cluster, about 55 million light years from us. Uh, this image was taken over the course of, uh, of four nights in April 2017. It doesn't look all that impressive, but scientifically it's, it was an amazing breakthrough. And the software that was created just to process the data and create this image was amazing. Uh, so the best way to describe what you're seeing is you're seeing the silhouette of a black hole because you can't actually, no light leaves the black hole, so you can't see the black hole, but you can see the silhouette, you can see the effects of the black hole, and you can see this accretion disk. And this is M87, the black hole's home um, in the constellation Virgo. Unlike the Milky Way, which is a stunning spiral galaxy, this is a very average elliptical kind of a blob. Matter of fact, if you're uh, waiting around to look through a telescope, uh, if you ask someone to point you towards Sagittarius, which is in that direction, uh, you'll be able to look in the direction of the black hole that's in the center of our galaxy. Because when you're looking at Sagittarius in that direction, you're actually looking towards the center of our galaxy. And there is a supermassive black hole there as well. You won't see the black hole, but you will you could see the direction of it. And there's just a lot of really interesting stuff uh, right around that, that area because you're looking through such a dense area of our galaxy. Now, a phenomenon known as gravitational lensing by very massive objects was first predicted by Einstein and discovered out in nature in 1979. And with the event of the Hubble telescope, we've been discovering more and more instances of this. And here's a great example. So the way that gravitational lensing works is that if you look towards a very massive cluster of galaxies, they're bending the fabric of space so much that if there's an object right behind it that we can't see, there's a chance that the light will follow the bend in space that, that is caused by the massiveness of the galaxy group and that we can see it. Very distorted, but we can see it. And that's what you're seeing here. This long arc of almost 90 degrees is actually a galaxy that's behind the galaxy group in the middle. And it has distorted space-time to such an extent that we can see behind it and see the galaxy on the perimeter, which is really behind that, that galaxy group. So the galaxy group's about 5 billion years away, 5 billion light years away, and they estimate that the galaxy we're looking at, distorted behind it, is about 10 billion light years away. Here's my favorite image of gravitational lensing. In this Hubble Space Telescope image from March of 2015, the many red galaxies, this, this box here is just a magnification of what we're looking at here. This is a, a very massive uh, cluster of galaxy, again, that is, uh, that is bending the fabric of, of space-time. And behind it, what, those four yellow images at those arrows, amazingly, are different phases of the same supernova explosion. was bent in four different directions and is seen at the edge, at the perimeter of, of this galaxy cluster. Just, to me, that's spellbinding. Um, it's an exploding supernova. Uh, I don't have an estimate of how far away that, that supernova is, but it is behind that galaxy. Um, 
so the the Einstein cross uh, comprises four images of a distant supernova created by the ga uh, gravitational lensing. In addition to giving us a closer look at the dynamics of, of distant supernova, uh, the team says that this discovery will help improve our understanding of the distribution of dark matter in the lensing galaxy and the galaxy cluster over there, as well as to further test Einstein's general theory of relativity by measuring the rate of cosmic expansion of the universe. And I'll leave you with one last gravitational lensing photo. It's known as gravity's grid. Uh, these two galaxies uh, that are in the middle there uh, are seen through the looking glass of uh, both X-ray and optical imaging by uh, Chandra X-ray Telescope and the Hubble Space Telescope. It's also nicknamed the Cheshire Cat Galaxy Group. Uh, the group's two large elliptical galaxies that are used as eyes are, uh, are suggestively framed by arcs of gravitationally lensed uh, galaxies. Uh, the arcs are optical images. Uh, the gravitational mass is dominated by dark matter. The two large eye galaxies represent the brightest members of this galaxy group that are, that are doing the, the gravitational lending, lensing. Uh, their relative collisional speed, they're, they're coming together and, and colliding at uh, about 1,350 kilometers per second. Um, and so this Cheshire uh, cat group grins in the constellation Ursa Major, which is the Big Dipper, about 4.6 billion light years away. So that is my talk. I, I do these talks in the hopes that a couple of you might be interested enough to take a look and do some research and look into this stuff. It's so much more exciting to me than science fiction, and I love science fiction, but this is real. This is real science. It's not fictional science, and, uh, and nothing here uh, is, is beyond your reach. You can find any of these pictures by looking on the internet, Googling Hubble Telescope uh, or Jet Propulsion Laboratory or NASA. All this stuff is out there for you to take a look at and, and dig a lot deeper if, if something, uh, something interests you. So thank you very much for your attention. And it looks like we're going to maybe have some observing. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Walt. And thank you guys for joining us. Uh, before we get into our Q&A session, because I know a couple of you guys here uh, filed in during the talk. So for those of you who don't know, we have the porta potty to my right, your left, if you need to use the bathroom. We After uh, we do the Q&A session, I will be over uh, in the room right in uh, the doorway surrounded by the red rope light that is a little museum and gift shop area um, we do have a number of uh, our observatories open for uh, viewing as well as i believe one of our members actually has their own personal scope set up out on the lawn next to the house so for q a i'm going to ask if you're in the audience and have a question you're going to raise your hand and kind of keep it up until i get to you with the microphone because chances are if you have a question someone else also has the same or similar question and just isn't uh, brave enough to ask it although brave is probably not the correct word anyhow uh, i'm going to start things off with a uh, fun question i actually saw from our online chat so their question is if jupiter is the solar system's vacuum whose job is it to empty the bin or change the bag <laughs> Oh boy, Jupiter takes care of that, it, him or herself. All right, do we have a question from our audience? Oh, yes. Like I said, just keep your hand up because I have to kind of watch where I'm stepping so I don't accidentally an entire person. Okay. Uh, sir, you said end of uh, star is like black hole. So. After black hole, you said another kind of star, right? Massive uh, kind of mass. So that doesn't eliminate any light. I'm the, sorry. From a black hole, can we see another star coming up from a black hole? I believe he's asking. No. Can, can we see a star coming out of a black hole? No, once once it falls into the black hole, it's it's gone. 
the gravity the gravity is 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 too intense for anything to come out. Although if you want to get into it, you could read Stephen Hawking's talks about uh, a type of radiation that comes off a black hole, um, Hawking's radiation, um, that supposedly if you give enough trillion years, a black hole may evaporate. But uh, that's not a black hole coming out. It's just that some some evaporation can occur in a black hole over trillions of years. All right. And I don't understand the science behind it at all. <laughs> black holes can merge, right? Black holes can get gravitationally locked and 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 merge, and and the that merger would co cause gravitational waves that could be measured on Earth if we were if if we were awake and and you know if we had the equipment uh, to measure it. Yeah, as far as we know. There's step beyond black hole, like a black hole. We don't know if a black hole would turn into anything else. Uh, that said, science always advances. Uh, All right. Uh, just to reiterate the question for our online audience, uh, that was about time travel. Can you repeat it? Yes, because everything is in past. So, is it in the scope of our galaxy, the like the telescope, whatever we are seeing? Is it within our scope of our galaxy, or we are seeing something beyond our galaxy? We, for the telescopes we have here, since it does take light time to reach the telescopes or any light gathering device, we can see things outside of our galaxy because we can't see other galaxies. Um, but we are seeing them as they were in the past because, again, it takes time for that light to reach us. Right. When, when I was talking about comets, planets, that's within our solar system. When I was talking about um, planetary nebula that we see, that was within our, our galaxy we, that we see and photograph that. And then I talk about other galaxies. Obviously, that's outside of our galaxy. And, and black holes, there's a black hole at the center of our galaxy. But the theory is, is that there's a black hole at almost, if not every single galaxy out there. And, uh, right. and again, that would be looking outside. We, do, we do have more people with questions, hon. So I do want to give other people also a chance. I'll be and I'll be here, too. I'll, I'll stick around. All right. So our next online question is, did you make the tracking system for your camera yourself? And either way, how much did it cost? Uh, it, it cost me about 10 bucks. Uh, you can get the plans on the internet. Just Google uh, uh, barn door hinge mount or scotch mount uh, for astronomy, and uh, you'll get plans. It's it's very easy. You need to buy a, uh, a carriage bolt, a hinge, uh, have a couple pieces of wood, and uh, the most expensive thing is what you're going to put on the board to mount your camera on. And I went cheap with that, but you could you know you could put a $200 camera mount on on that board if you wanted to. But All the, right. the hinge itself is very cheap so next question first thanks for the talk uh when you were doing pictures of the lensing and we saw some of the the swirls from the galaxies behind that yeah right does the bending of space is it always spherical that we know of because that would i mean the reflection of something like like that arc that you were showing mm -hmm. would to me suggest that the spending of space is actually spherical it, it then does it would be a top reflection that's how i looked at it is that accurate or we you don't know it know? does look spherical and uh, and a lot of the stuff we see up there is is spherical um and i can't say i'm an expert in the astrophysics behind it but if you have a group of galaxies that are that are asymmetrical it seems to me that their effect their effect on space time would most likely be a spherical to some point but but a, a single a, a, a single object would be a spherical effect yeah thank you I have two questions one mm -hmm. is uh, the the uh, the stars that we see here in our sky and the constellation are all of those part of our galaxy Milky Way or or not they are yes they are Yes. Second, second question is uh, the uh, you know I, I know our nearest galaxy is Andromeda. 
what's the best time to see that galaxy in the sky, uh, you know, through our eyes? What's Just the best time? The best time to see what galaxy? The, uh, the Andromeda, the nearest galaxy from us. The Andromeda, you, um, you can see that uh, this evening, even. Oh, oh really? Yeah. Oh. It's, it's, a, it's a very large ex extended object, but uh, it's starting to rise now. You'll be able to see it best <clears throat> in the fall and early winter. Um, right around this time, it's just coming up that those trees all the way on the other end, right where that car's <laughs> shining a light. It'll be right up in, the, in that area, and it's just starting to rise around this time at this time of year. But give it another month or two, and it'll be a lot easier to see. Through our eyes or through telescope? You know, if it's dark, I've seen it naked eye because I know where to look. Uh, you can certainly see it with binoculars. And with a telescope, it's, it'll be larger than your field of view because it's, a, it's actually a very large object. It's a very large, it's like the, the object itself is maybe three or four moon widths long. So that's, that's a big object. Uh, yeah. All right, we're gonna get an online question in here. Um, don't many astrophotographers use a standard color palette corresponding to certain elements they use filters for if they are going to colorize? Yeah, um, it, 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 that can get into a large discussion. A lot of astrophotographers use a color uh, camera and, and then they just enhance. Others use black and white and they use RGB filters and take an exposure of each and then digitally they lay them all together and and that's how they come up with color but you know it's really whatever the per whatever the taste of the person who's creating that image is unless it's being done for scientific pur purposes that person's going to fool around with the color palette until he gets to what he likes you're not going to take something that comes out red in hydrogen alpha and make it you know green that would that that would obviously you, it would it would rub everyone the wrong way that knows anything about astronomy, but <laughs> you know you might enhance that red and and add a little U to it. All right, we got another question here. Uh, can we influence or alter the path of like comets by adding external manual forces like electromagnetism or whatever? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't get that. Can we influence the trajectory of any uh, space objects like a comet or asteroid by? using external forces project the trajectory of objects so like comet or asteroid heading straight for us we have movies saying oh we're going to blow it up and throw it off its course is that actually humanly possible it's possible we're not there yet but yeah you i mean if something's coming at you and and you hit it just right you can nudge it i mean when something's going far out there you just turn one degree and and you've changed the trajectory a million miles away quite quite dramatically so it's possible but I'm yeah we're not there everyone. not that i know of all uh, right <laughs> our next online question was if you can go study any one of these objects you've shown us what would you choose oh my yes <laughs> there's there's just so much i i love that, that butterfly nut nebula I like studying uh, the planets. The planets are very interesting. Uh, the moons on the planets, and and they're very easy to study with uh, with backyard telescopes. Sorry, Even looking at the moon, right. and 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 uh, and just crater hunting at different phases of the moon is an awful lot of fun, and can be done uh, very inexpensively. All right, you had a question, Ken. Um, is there any such thing as a white hole? Did you hear the question, huh? Was there any such thing as a white hole? A white what? A white, white hole. hole, as in the opposite of a black hole. Not that I know of. All right. Our next online question is, where was the Event Horizon Telescope that took the picture of the black hole? That's a, that's a gr uh, great question. That's something you should Google. Uh, I, I'm quite sure that's an Earth-bound scope. I'm not. So I. Do you know where it is? Although I don't. The thing is, there wasn't any one particular location for the scope. What it was is because I believe, because you can't see a black hole, they were using radio telescope data, and to get enough data and the correct data, 
what they were using is a whole bunch of different sites tied together in a system to basically make a telescope the size of the Earth using radio telescopes is what I believe. And keep in mind, this is from what I've read through online articles and whatnot, so always double check me. Um, but I believe that is uh, the very like bare bones kind of what happened. If you want more technical difficulties, I'm certain you could find information through like the NASA website or whatnot. I'm sure they have ar articles upon articles about that. Yeah, just to Google away. All right, do we have another question from our audience here? Anyone? All right, so we got, I think, one last question. No, no, it looks like I actually managed to get them all. Let me avoid uh, running directly into a poll with my <laughs> face. All right, I want to thank you all for coming out. I want to thank you guys who are here in our audience. And again, thank our online chat. And thank you all for coming out and having, uh, giving this talk. And with that, have a good night, guys. Thanks, everyone. Hope you get to see some cool stuff out there.